Welcome to gagrule.net. Today, in today's episode, we're going to be talking to uh, Professor George Bernutian. And the subject today would be about Armenian cinema from early time, also Armenian-Iranian film, and how also they did in Russia. So this is about a book uh, Professor Siranush wrote about it, and but uh, Professor uh, Bernutian is going to uh, explain a little bit more about the book and the printing and all that uh, budget and financial and hope, hopefully people who hear this will start contribute uh, to uh, making this book become reality. And this is the first book about Armenian cinema. And so today uh, it is great pleasure, honor, privilege to welcome uh, Professor George Bernutian and, uh, and you want to see he is, uh, he is the most dynamic uh, speaker that you probably ever, if you have ever been into one of his uh, lecture, you know what I'm talking about. George, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be on your program and I'm honored. I am going to discuss today something important that we, uh, in public, myself and my publisher and many other people in Armenia are very interested, and that is a book that's written by Siranush Galustian, a 12-chapter book, a large book, almost 300 pages, on an overview of the history of the Armenian cinema. Now, many people say, well, why Armenian cinema? Armenian cinema had its beginning at the end of the 19th century when a film was screened in Yerevan. After that, Armenian directors like Bek Nazarov or Bek Nazarian became one of the major filmmakers of the silent era. He's very famous in Russia, in all the film schools, as famous as people like Eisenstein and Pudovkin, the great Russian directors. Armenian cinema actually took its root, of course, after Soviet Armenia, slowly, and then when the sound came, Armen film started making films in Yerevan. The book is about the history of all the different films, the actors, the famous directors, how they managed to make films during the Stalin period, what happened after the Stalin people period, how Armenia blossomed in making more open movies, and especially in the 70s and 80s when Armenia for the first time began making films about the genocide. And uh, I'm, I'm not talking about documentary, I'm talking about feature films with actors who had stories about the genocide and stories about modern life in Yerevan and modern life in Armenian villages and stories based on famous Armenian uh, short stories or Armenian novels, so like Rafi and a few others. So we have quite a number of good films made and then the last, ch there's a chapter on documentary films in Armenia, and finally the last chapter is about films after the fall of the Soviet Union, the last 20 years of Armenian independent films and how they are doing all over the world, the great directors, etc. The book is in color. The, the main problem is we could have printed the book in black and white, but it wouldn't have served the gorgeous the gorgeous pictures and the plates, because there is a main chapter on Parajanov, that great Armenian director who lived in Georgia and in Ukraine, but he came to Armenia, and his film, Sayatnova, is considered one of the greatest films, not by Armenians, but the entire world. And of course, his film, Shadow of the Forgotten Ancestors, which was made in Ukraine, I mean, has nothing to do with Armenians, but he directed it is the most awarded film in, in the history of the Russian cinema. And so uh, these, the, the plates are in color. And in order to print this book and do it justice, the publisher needs financial support. We have raised some money. I have managed to raise some from my sources. 
Earth were short, I don't know exactly how much, I think it's about five to seven thousand dollars short. And if anybody donates even two hundred fifty dollars, they will get two copies, free copies of this book, which is going to be close to a hundred dollars a piece. So they are basically getting two hundred dollars back to give the books as gifts, birthday gifts, graduation gifts, New Year gifts, Christmas gifts, and Tell me something that young people will like. Tell me something everybody can understand. And I think it's a worthwhile project. My publisher Mazda has done quite a large number of Armenian studies series. I'm the editor of those series. We have published so far 18 volumes in this series, dealing with Karabakh, dealing with uh, Stopping Azeri Lies About Garabakh. There are three books, four books on Garabakh. There are books from Arakel of Tabriz. There is, of course, my concise history of the Armenian people, which is used in almost every university here, Australia and Canada, as the main textbook, including UC Irvine and UCLA, and Glendale Community College and other places. And also, that book is now translated uh, this concise history into Turkish and to give credit nothing was changed including all my maps inside which show an Armenian Empire uh, translated in Arabic Spanish Armenian and Russian a Japanese version is soon coming and next year hopefully we'll have a Persian version so they are doing a good job this publisher is trying to do the Armenian series is doing very well and even Richard Hovanesian has his own series, the series of Armenian cities in Western Armenia. Uh, I, he asked me about this publisher, and I said it's a good publisher, and Richard also joined in his own series with this publisher. So the publisher is really pro-Armenian. Not pro-Armenian doesn't mean he publishes everything, but he is very careful. We send it to readers. We, it's a peer-reviewed process and the book on history of Armenia has a history of Armenian film has been reviewed by a number of people and they have all unanimously considered it the best book so far in any language this book was written in Armenian it's been translated into English edited and all of us including myself and although I'm a, I'm a historian one of my major loves is cinema. And if you see behind me, those are not books. Books are in the other room. Those are all films. That entire wall you see behind me are DVDs from almost every major film in the world in every language, including Armenian and Russian and Persian and so forth. So uh, I write on film. I write film reviews. I've been to almost every major film festival. And so... To me, films are important because it reaches a larger audience, especially in today's world where most people, younger people, are not as much readers as much as visual arts. Exactly. So, so I truly recommend it. Now I will let you ask any questions. Well, actually, I, I wanted to ask a little bit about you. That's, I always ask uh, Armenian 15 year and older where is your root? You mean where do we come from? Where are you, yourself? Oh, and how did you get into this uh, authoring books and history and what got you in it? It's a very interesting story. Oh, I'm from Iran. I was born in Iran and at age 21 we immigrated to Los Angeles, so I was a California kid. And my interest, believe it or not, was not history at all. I wanted to be a medical doctor because my in Iran, I had studied a lot of biology and chemistry and organic chemistry. But uh, when I arrived here, uh, we were one of those Armenians from Iran who had who arrived with nothing, and I mean nothing. If, even our airplane fare was borrowed. So I had to work the night shift and all the classes about pre-med were in the afternoon and all the labs were in the afternoon. So I couldn't do it. And in those days, this is 50 years ago, 
in those days, there were, the Armenian community was very small. There were no scholarships and none of the stuff that we have today. And so I worked the night shift in my, what I, my, my other love is classical music. So I worked in uh, classical music stores, record stores. It's closed now, but it was the famous Wallex Music City, corner of Sunset and Vine. And I worked there for many years and I continued working in music and in film, uh, film industry, mostly photogra uh, taking pictures of the Academy Awards. I have a lot of pictures for newspapers from Academy Awards and festivals and in music. And then I went to UCLA at the same time. And one day I, I was taking literature, film and music at UCLA and one day I took Tuesday, Thursday was my only day because I worked full time. One day I looked at the catalog and I saw Iranian history and I saw Armenian history and I said, well, it's Tuesday, Thursday, I need some <laughs> electives and I took the classes. And the classes, Richard Hovanesian and Banani, I mean Banani, the Iranian guy, when they found out that I know Armenian, I know Persian, I know Russian, they meet and they, they were just opening. Those departments are brand new in UCLA many years ago. This is talking about 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago. And so they were just new uh, baby departments and they needed serious graduate students or students who were eventually would go to graduate and maybe get a PhD. So when they met me they, and they knew I had the languages, which is the key to this work, they said, look, George, we'll give you all the help and scholarships you need. We will arrange because you will get all the financial support. And they did. And so after that, it became, uh, you know, I did both Iran, Armenia, and Russia, I added later on, because I knew the languages. And uh, you know, I managed to finish, get my BA, MA, and PhD from UCLA. And then in 76, and then I taught for two years at Glendale Community College which is now Levon Marashlan is teaching. I started that program. Then I came to New York. I was offered to, to teach Armenian history at Columbia University. I did that for three years. And then the job market dried up. For the next eight years, I could not find a full-time job. Even though I knew all the languages, I had a PhD, I already had a book which had received fantastic reviews. There were no jobs. So for eight years, I taught part-time, adjunct, visiting here, there, other places, uh, did uh, programs uh, everywhere until Iona, 26 years ago, at age 45, I got my first full-time tenure track job. And so because I had waited so long and I had accumulated all this material, which there was no point of publishing because there were no jobs, I immediately started, because I had the material and the languages and I had the books planned, I started publishing uh, almost more than one book a year. And so in a short time, uh, in the last 26 years, I've had 28 books. Wow, and of, that's amazing. And of course, yeah, and of course, Iona, being a small college, appreciated me because I put them on the map. Everywhere I go, it's Iona, Iona, I'm on television, I go to Europe, I give lectures all over the world. They have my books in every major library around the world, if you look at it, Germany, everywhere, and I get reviews, good reviews, and so Iona is very grateful, and so they have given me very fast promotion to the top rank, one of the highest salaries and best offices, and I'm very much appreciated by the president, the provost, and the dean. So where where your uh, where your uh, family background comes, like your father, grandfather? That's very interesting. My grandfather is from Van. They escaped during the genocide, and they came to first to uh, Iranian Iran, and then they moved from Iran to Baku, believe it or not. And my father was born in Baku. Therefore, my father did not read and write Armenian. My father spoke Armenian very poorly. I mean, not poorly, but street Armenian. He spoke Russian, and he read and wrote Russian very well. So he spoke Russian to me. 
my grandfather and grandmother spoke Armenian to me. And I was raised in Iran, obviously, so I learned Persian in Iran. My mother was Polish. She was one of those survivors of World War II who met my father in Iran. And my mother spoke Polish to me, so I speak Polish very well. And I have done a large a number of uh, material. I've done two articles on Poland. The new Polish-Armenian uh, calendar that's coming out for 2015 has a chapter and a month that I have written on Armenians of Iran, Polish. I have written the travel account of Simon of Poland, the Armenian Catholic from Lvov, who went around the world. And I have written that book about Simon Lehatsi, Simon of Poland. And I recently I did another article for Poland. So I've been to Poland a number of times. And so this is a background, a combination of mishmash of everything. I guess that's why one learns the languages. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? Interesting history. Well, it's because it's mainly languages that allowed me to do, I mean, this book, the 1823 Russian survey of, uh, you, you can see it, yeah. 1823 survey of the Karabakh province, which was already printed twice. The first printing sold out in six months, and they went to the second printing because this book, five years before Turkmen Chai, proves that what the Azeris are saying is totally wrong. Azeris are now saying there were no Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. Armenians arrived only after 1828, as you remember from my lecture, after the immigration. But I proved that only 200 Armenian families went to Karabakh. The rest went to Yerevan and Nakhchevan. And five years before Turkmen Chai, the Russians went to every village in Karabakh and recorded how many men, how many women, how many Armenian villages, etc., how much taxes they paid, etc. And this is five years before, and it's a Russian survey, long before any Armenian nationalism, any question of Nagorno-Karabakh, you know, this is 100, 200 years ago almost, and they prove that the five Mahals, the five districts which formed the Nagorno-Karabakh at the time had 90, 6.7% Armenian. There were only two Tatar, they didn't even call them Azeri, there was no such thing until 1918, Tatar villages. And on top of that, the five Armenian Mahans paid more taxes per capita than the Muslims. Because they were doing, they had all the trade, all the artisan, the shoemakers, the jewelers, the tinsmiths, iron workers, blacksmiths, everything, Armenians were producing much more than anybody else and paying taxes more than anybody else. So I send it to them to shut them up. And after that, I don't know. They got, I know they got the copy, but what they have done, I have no idea. But this book really, I went to Garabagh, I lectured on this book. It, I was on TV, they were very welcome. Armenian television, Armenian newspapers. I lectured at the American University on this. And they need to have invited me to teach their one term next, this coming fall, next fall, if I get a Fulbright, I've applied for a Fulbright, and if I get it, I have an invitation to go and start teaching basically in English the same kind of lectures I gave that you heard last week, because not because I'm good, etc., but because that kind of lectures they don't give in Yerevan. In Yerevan, nothing wrong with Yerevan, but Yerevan, they don't, certain things they don't cover. You know, it's not their fault. Some in the Yerevan University, they're kind of worried that anything that may be used by the Azeris negatively, they try not to talk about it. And for example, this thing of population transfers, you know. Many, some Armenians are unhappy when I and others say, well, you know, Armenians in Yerevan were not a majority. But that doesn't matter. They have to realize that they were not a majority because they were driven out. They were driven out and they were sent by Shah Abbas and the wars. And when the wars ended, they returned. I always give the example of Israel. You know, the Jews were not even half of the majority that the Armenians had in Yerevan. The Jews were barely 10% of present-day Israel. 
2,000 years later, they slowly immigrated. Well, Armenians immigrated back. They're not the same people, obviously. The children of the people who had gone all over the world, diaspora, came back to Israel. Armenians returned after only 200 years. And Armenians had to just cross the river, the Arax River. The Jews came from all over Europe, Asia, Africa, etc., to Israel. Armenians had to just cross the Arax River 200 years after they'd been pushed out. So there's no shame in that. You understand my there's point? There's no shame in the truth. No, there's no shame in the truth. So big deal, Armenians were a minority, yes. But there's a reason they were a minority. The same reason the Jews were a minority in Israel, because 2,000 years ago, the Romans destroyed their temple and kicked them out. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's the truth. On the, on the subject of, I know this probably would be long, but if you have a short answer, um, actually, before I go there, that Turkmancha, when you said, it just happened to be yesterday, I met an Iranian guy, so I said to him, do you know what Turkmancha is? Oh, he says, every Iranian knows that. <laughs> so every, every Iranian calls it the most shameful, yeah. terrible. I mean, it's become every Iranian. Yeah. So, you so you, I, I proved it that what you said with Iranian, like he, he just said, uh, yeah, absolutely. Like he, he went on and talking about it, other things. Um, about uh, Azerbaijan, when did Azerbaijan got, the Republic got separated from the province of Azerbaijan and who did? And also the second question is... What, wait a minute, wait one second, what do you mean the province? Why, well, apparently uh, there is Azerbaijan province in Iran, right? Yeah, but that was always there going back to the old days. It was known as Adar Badagan. Right. In old days. This Azerbaijan has nothing to do with separating from the other Azerbaijan. So the IC. This Azer there was no such thing as the Azerbaijan that's now the Republic. They were nine, they were seven Khanates. Each one had a separate Khan under Iranian rule. And then in 1918, when the Russian Empire fell, that area was seven Khanates. After the Russians conquered the seven Khanates, they renamed the area first the Muslim province, then the Caspian province. Later on, they divided it into the Baku province, the Ganja province. Later on, they combined all of it into Baku province, Elizabeth Paul province. That's how it was. Until the fall of the Russian Empire. Then, when Georgia declared itself independent in 1918 during that chaos, that short two year, Armenia declared itself, well, Armenia was third. The Muslims of this Elizabeth Paul Baku region declared themselves independent and started calling them the country Azerbaijan. So it's a new term. They used, the reason they used it is because the Iranian Azerbaijan also speaks the same kind of Turkish they speak. They are also Shiite, like Iranian Azerbaijanis. They are Shiite. Their alphabet was Persian. They wrote in Persian, Arabic script, but Persian, not Turkish. There was no Azeri alphabet or Azeri written script. There was a spoken Azeri known as Turki or Turki. All right, which is different from the Istanbul in Turkey. It has a lot of Persian and local words. And because this side of the Arabs, the Iranian Azerbaijan spoke the same language, they adopted the name Azerbaijan. And, and today, unfortunately, Baku keeps on talking about we are northern Azerbaijan, Iranian Azerbaijan is southern Azerbaijan, and one day we will unite and become the greater Azerbaijan, which will include half of Armenia too, because half of Armenia is ours. Zangezu is ours, most of the area around Lake Sevan is ours, and part of Georgia is ours. Armenia has only the little corner of Yerevan, and that's it. That's, that's how they look, showed it by their maps. If you look at the map today, their maps, it shows a great Azerbaijan, which includes all of northwestern Iran, half of Armenia, a part of Georgia, and it's an empire. 
<laughs> well, maybe that's what their plan was. Well, same thing with the Turkey. If there is a, uh, I, I didn't, I just didn't know we were going to talk about this. But there is a map in, in they were teaching in a Turkish school until 2012. They were showing Armenia didn't existed, Bulgaria didn't existed, half of Syria didn't existed, half Iraq didn't existed, until the Bulgarian uh, education minister protested and I don't know whether they changed it or not. And so both those, they always claim those stuff. I know, but they teach it in schools and that's the problem. Exactly. See, they teach it so people who do not, who, who do not go higher education or who become average workers don't know any better. We don't do that in Yerevan or Armenian schools in Yerevan. We have never done that. You know, in my book on the maps, occasionally I show the maps of a different era of Armenia, but present day or the 19th century or even 18th century map of, there is no such, you know, and we never, none of us true scholars would never do that because it's funny, they'll laugh at us. Yeah. But they don't mind, they don't care. Now, back to the, the book. Uh, who is Professor Siranush? She is, she, is a, she is involved in film, she has written on film, she has done research on film, and uh, she has done articles, short studies on cinema. Cinema is her field. She's attended com conferences, she's gone to film festivals, and she has gathered all the information on Armenian cinema from previous. There are only very few. I have three or four little little Armenian books, 50 pages, 60 pages in Armenian and Russian about Armenian cinema, but nothing like this, nothing of research that approaches 300 pages and goes into detail of every aspect of Armenian film. So she's, she's in charge of that? She's, she's in charge. She's a specialist on Armenian cinema and she's worked many years on this. Do he, he, the, do he live... Uh, in Yerevan or outside Yerevan? Oh, she, Armenia. Lives in, she lives in Armenia. Mm, okay. And she's done the Russian archives, she's done the Armenian archives, she's checked Armenian filmmakers in Georgia, she's checked Armenian filmmakers in other... Because you see, Armenian filmmakers, not just the actors and filmmakers, but Armenian actors have played many roles in Russian films. Armenian composers, Armenian cinematographers not just in Yerevan or Armenia, they have worked also in other places, in Russian cinema. So it's very interesting to see the role. For example, I wrote a short article some time ago about the role of the Armenians in Iranian cinema. Did you know that the first film made in Iran was made by two Armenians? The first film made in Iran was made by Armenians. And until the Islamic Republic, Armenian directors, Armenian actors, Armenian cinematographers, Armenian film composers, during the Shah, I have the catalog. I have the complete catalog of every Iranian film made from the beginning to the Islamic Republic. You should see the amount, the number of Armenian names. This is before the Islamic Republic, when they were making films, you know, openly actors, actresses, women who were not, the face, the hair wasn't covered, detective movies, love stories, kissing each other on the screen, none of that is allowed. So all of those people left. Some of them are in Glendale. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, in every country, I think Armenian have participated in uh, uh, this kind of activities, whether cinema or other. The only thing we Armenian don't get involved in politics. That's the one thing is they shy away. Yes, for example, you just said it. Ruben Mamoulian is considered one of the greatest American film directors, and the first Technicolor movie in the United States was made by Ruben Mamoulian. Right, and he was magnificent. He is. He's considered one of the great directors. And so you see. So we have done. We've done quite a lot. And Zailian, the script writer, who's done quite a lot of scripts, I think including uh, Schindler's List. So, if I'm not mistaken. So when, when are you expecting this book to come out? 
The book is ready. The minute we get the funding, once we have the funding, the book can come out in two months. I see. Because everything is on computer, as you very well know now. Yeah. Once you have the funding, you send the disk or the chip to the printer. The printer puts it in the machine, gets a proof. We look at the proof, and it's fine. We say, go ahead. He presses the button, and it's just a matter of binding and shipping. So you, are you involved in, in the book uh, as far as the writing of, or offering? No, writing, no. Writing is written by Siranus Galustia. Okay. It's been translated. I may write a short preface once we have the funds, because I'm so much involved in cinema, and we will see. But until the funds come, you know, I managed to raise a thousand dollars from one organization, but now we are trying to get a little bit more money. And if if people who are interested just give 250, you know, if if 40 people even give 250, we'll have enough money to print it. 40. Well, even if the, even if they just put the orders now by the books, I think it was like fifty dollar or something. Yeah, it's the same thing. It will come to the same thing. Yeah. Instead so of don't. Yeah, it's we, like high, we really highly encourage people. You know, fifty dollar would not. I mean, it's not the big things because this is first book and it's it's really really important that whatever you know, like uh, you buy them for Christmas. You know, give uh, give a gift. You know, I think it's it will be the first book in a Western language. Yeah, there is I, no book either in English, French, German, Russian, there isn't. This is going to be the first book in non-Armenian language in the world. And it can go to a lot of places. And yeah. in Hollywood, with all the acting and all that stuff, it's important to have something to show that Armenian cinema is alive, was alive and well, and is alive and well. Well, that's why we wanted to do this, and we hope that people who watch this program, you know, they just just buy it for Christmas or, you know, give a gift, you know, like $50. It's not going to make you or break you, but but it's uh, lots of history behind this, you know. Great. And, uh, and then also they they help the Armenian intellectuals, you know, into... That's very important. Yeah. yeah. She's not getting anything. Siranush Kalustan is not making any money on this. I, I have to make sure you understand that. No one, it's just for printing the book. Yes. This is not for paying her. She's already done her job. And we have translated it. That cost has been done. The cost of the pictures, everything has been done. It's a matter of printing. You know, all the plates, everything is ready. The main job is done. The more difficult job is finished. Now so, it's the easy job of printing it. So what is that you said? How much is the total budget you're looking for? Well, I don't remember. He, he gave the sheets. My publisher gave the sheets. I think seven thousand dollars should That's be. That's not enough. a big deal, you know. Like I mean, they should for a, for an Armenian community. Yeah, no, a million strong in the United States. You're talking about less than seven cents. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope I hope people I hope people would would look at this from the historic. Uh, prospect, you know, like they, they, they should open their wallet and uh, and help because uh, I believe I am myself. I'm not a movie goer and things, but I think this is very historical book, and uh, I would I would just buy a couple of them, just give it gift to you know. So yes, I would not really go on go on television if it was not important. I yes. have never done it for any one of my own books. I have never gone on TV or I have received help for my own books but from individuals, individuals who know me, who value my work, but not for a large number. One or two people, they give a check for 3,000 or 5,000, one person. And I thank them in the book, but I have never gone collecting, you know. Yeah, I, wish, I wish we uh, we arranged the, the publisher um, as the publishing, you know, to maybe they just, during the Christmas, they would throw in maybe, you know, 10, 20 percent discount or something, just encourage they people. Usually, they do. They usually do. They do? They usually do, for sure. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're going to put also for the people uh, in the show note, and we're also putting it on the screen that where, where they could buy, order this book, and also we're going to put on the show note, and so the people, you know, go to this... Uh, 
uh, www.mazdapublishing.com and there is not only this book and also there are all the books that you you authored and published. Are, the books are there and you have the picture, the cover of this book already in color. I will, I'm already yeah. putting it right now, as you don't see it, but it's on the screen, the, the cover. Yeah, but yeah, I, I hope everybody will just uh, generously. All, all we can do is hope. Yes. I mean, we are, to me, it's not like uh, we, it's, I wish it because I think it's a worthwhile project, but it depends on the public. You know, you can only ask the rest you have no control over. That's true. That's true. But but I'm sure I'm sure they'll, uh, people will come through this. I hope they do. Uh, we'll uh, we'll send this link to other people too. Uh, yeah, they, it's 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 a great project, and I give uh, all the credit to Sir uh, Professor Siranush. Yeah, I remember. For example, I'm sure you know this. Every time you go to a movie and the credits come, what do you do when you look at the credits? <laughs> that's the first thing you notice. Oh, Haye, Haye. Oh, that's Armenian name. Oh, that's Armenian name. You and we all do that. I know. So why not? This is this is all about Armenian films and yeah. Armenian film. Yeah, yeah. It's. it's uh, I mean, every we you know like when we we grow up like especially my generation, your generation, we didn't have those privileges. You know, like we were. Our parents, they were either orphans or refugees, and we were just trying to survive. But now we have all this technology and stuff available, and of course, wealth too. Um, I don't think too many Armenians you find poor around, you know, they're all hardworking people. Armenians are doing well because they are hardworking, yeah. and I take my hat off to them. Yeah. But they have to remember that uh, money is wonderful to have it great. But if you don't do something worthwhile with it, it's wasted. Yeah, money is only good for what it does. Well, I mean, this is why you know, like those books, they help the new generation to to see, uh, because you know, like for me, like when I was going to school, history and geography was was ple I didn't know when the class the class would be over. You know, it was boring. Give give me math. Give me math, you know algebra and all that stuff you know but now when you get to the point where you say oh my god i should i should have learned something you know and uh, but that's why we're trying to dig into uh, generous people like you you spent all your time writing those books and i tell you like uh, last uh, lecture when i i saw two of your lecture and both of them i recorded but the last lecture it was like one hour to me was like 10 minutes. It's, it was like the things you do, the things you do, you drag people to that day. You know, like when you were talking 1800, I was feeling I am at 1800. I'm seeing what is going on, you know. And so you really do a good job, you know. And I'm not like, trying to schmooze or anything, but you're just uh, very dynamic when you... When you speak, you just drag people with you, you know. Thank you, thank and you it's for the compliment, because as you said, you said you didn't, uh, you were waiting for your class to be over. The reason was, history can be taught two ways. It can be taught as a boring lecture that the professor just reads and mumbles, or it can be taught dynamically with maps, with current, with explanation of how it affects us today, and people will respond. Yes. History is not boring. Only the speakers can be boring. That is absolutely true. That is absolutely true. So that you're, you're throwing lots of, uh, as I said, dynamic into making it this, your lectures, the history, it's extremely interesting. And as you saw, you saw that in lecture, there was no chair empty, you know. People no, the response was very, very yeah. good. And they really, I, if, 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 if the chair did not stop the questions, I think we could have gone for another two hours with questions. Well, absolutely. Well, I had so many questions I wanted to ask, but then I didn't want to take from other people because I knew I could always get a hold of you, but uh, people there, I, you know, I wanted to, they asked. An hour of questions and the guy finally had to stop it. Yeah. But I could have gone for another hour. Why not? 
I think you're, you, maybe you think you're old, but I think, I think you're 21 year old energy. <laughs> um, so, um, maybe, maybe we could, maybe we could do some other, uh, other videos, uh, whatever, some new book. What is, no, what is your, uh, latest book? Well, I'm now working at the same thing I showed you about the Garabakh. Russians did a survey in 1820 of the Shirvan province. Now, Shirvan is next to Garabakh. It doesn't have as many Armenian villages, but there was 18 to 20 percent of the population was Armenian, about 18 percent. And there were Armenian villages. The important is not that Armenians had villages there or it belongs. No, no. The importance of this is that it's for the first time, both in the Garabakh book and this book, we find out what the taxes were, who, what kind of taxes were they collecting. This information has never been found. So, you oh. you, you're, you cut off. That's why the book sold so well. So I'm working on, yeah. so now I'm working on the Russian survey of Shirvan province. And then the third one is the Shaki province. There are only three Russians did only three. These are the Khanates I mentioned. What is Khanate? You keep saying Khanate. Khanuchun, ruled by a Khan, governed by a Khan. Okay. Khanuchun, Khan. And there were Khans. These Khans were governors. Most of them were hereditary, and they they were they were under Iranian suzerainty, but they were semi-autonomous. There was a Khan of Garabakh, a Khan of Shirvan, Khan of Shaki, Khan of Baku, Khan of Obe, Khan of Kalesh, Khan of Ganja, Khan of Achavan, and Khan of Derben. These were Khans. Okay, after the first Russo-Iranian War, Yerevan and Achavan remained part of Iran. All the rest became part of Russia. And Russia sent people slowly to survey these areas. After the second Russo-Iranian War, Treaty of Turkmenchai, Russia combined Yerevan and Nakhchevan into what became the Armenian province. And it, and it allowed Armenians from Iran to repatriate back after 200 years, where they had run away to Georgia, some had run away to other places, most of them were in Iran forced by Shah Abbas to return to this new Armenian province, what became known as Russian Armenia. And it's in this Russian Armenia, part of it, we lost some of it, part of it that today the Republic of Armenia exists. Do you have any books on Western Armenia? No, because I don't read Turkish. It's unfortunately uh, not a very clear picture. So the, what about uh, Akshman? He wrote lots of books about, and he's Turk. Oh, Akshman. Yeah. But Akshman is writing on the genocide. Right, but still, like for example, now he has another book, uh, which is, uh, he, uh, it's uh, called Islamized Armenians and no, he's, he's wonderful, but he's writing on the 20th century. I don't deal with the 20th century. I'm interested in dealing with, I wish I knew Ottoman so I could write the history of Armenians in, in Turkish side in the 8th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. As in Garabakh, in 1823, I can precisely point out how many Armenians were in Yerevan, how many Armenians were in Baku, in Tiflis, in Moscow. We have records in Nakhchevan. On this side, we don't. We have this huge one and a half million Armenian population, which was destroyed, unfortunately. It would be very interesting to find out. But how about those Armenians in Turkey? They speak those things. Well, I no, guess they, they, they cannot read. Yeah, them. that's true, that's true. The Ottoman language was destroyed in 1928. Atatürk changed it to Latin alphabet. So anybody born after 1928, 1929 cannot read it, yeah. including all the Turks today. They have to go, scholars have to study it as a separate thing. 
you know, as a separate field. Only historians or economists, and they are all Turks, mostly 99.9%, who are studying separately to learn this dead language. That was, that was by design, by Ataturk. You know, he wanted to erase the, the memory, change the language, and new generation will be left in dark. They have no clue. Yeah. But now he's changing that things. Um, well, we have like uh, two minutes left. Uh, what What do you want to say in... You mean in closing, in conclusion? Yeah. Well, just telling our Armenian audience, or even non-Armenian audience, people who are interested in the history of the Caucasus, Iran, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Russia, that there is quite a lot of material still left to be published and uh, the only way they're going to see these things coming out is to support, not to me necessarily, but the support of scholars. And so when they see a certain book is coming out, you know, maybe they could buy this book, any book. If they're interested, they should invest in it and either donate it to their own library, which is tax deductible if you donate to your own library, even public library, or give it to people interested for holidays as a gift, birthday gift, and etc. Book, in my not because I write it, book is the best gift. Always people have to book is a gift that continues giving forever. Yeah, you could keep it you could keep it forever. And it continues giving and you can give it to your children. Whereas everything else is not the same. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for coming. And we hope we could do some more of these things about the new books. And I hope anybody who's listening, they would just go and buy this book. And as we said, donate it. Uh, you donate to library or whatever, your friend, your cousins. It's, it's, uh, best. it's, it's a very good cause. And thank again, I thank you very much. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.